Hello, and um, thanks so much for coming uh, today and joining us either um, uh, currently in person virtually or um, uh, at a later time via YouTube. Wanted to um, have this opportunity to introduce myself. Um, my name is Nia Zalamea. I'm one of the general surgeons in the Department of Surgery, um, but I've also uh, found myself um, uh, involved in the Herbert, uh, Herbert Schoenberg Scholars Multicultural Health Exchange Program for medical students. And I, it's a whole mouthful of words there, but wanted to um, just give some basic um, outline of, of how this developed uh, what it's for when, and what are the intentions of the program, and then some logistical stuff if you should happen to be um, become interested in applying. So I have the dates here. Um, these dates are for 2023. Um, we are opening up um, uh, this, the rotation um, is decided upon by uh, conversations with um, uh, our partners at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel, and is very much strategic um, in terms of uh, maximizing your experience as a student, decreasing stress around the match, and then also maximizing cross-cultural exchange, both um, among students and then also uh, with your patients and community. Um, with uh, that, we'll go ahead and get started here. So um, first background is that um, this program really kind of began as a family affair. Um, uh, all of the scholars who are involved with the program ultimately will absolutely meet the Shaneberg Lazaro family and hopefully more folks will as well. Um, but it just really began um, out of a vision of some grandchildren, uh, three grandchildren specifically um, of the Shaneberg Lazaro family here in Memphis. Um, some are in medicine, some are not, um, but they're ab absolutely big active members of the community who are interested in carrying on the legacy of their grandfather, uh, Mr. Herbert Shainberg. And so here's a little bit something about him. Um, he was absolutely a, a leader, a thought leader, but also a leader in action. Um, he was interested in integration um, uh, between and across all cultures and races well before the civil rights movement. Um, he was actually a local businessman, and so he had the opportunity to lead by action. Um, he had a store um, over on Main Street. Um, they were called black and white stores because they were preceded by black and white tiles in the um, atrium of the store. And you'll still see some of those downtown. I think there's only one left by Jolly Royal Furniture downtown. But interestingly, one of the things that his grandchildren uh, mentioned to us is that um, he would lead them um, in a non sort of prescriptive way, just when they would go on their uh, regular run to Dyer's hamburgers. I'm not sure if you've ever been to Dyer's, but um, at that time, Dyer's hamburgers, much like every other institution, restaurant, business, et cetera, in the city had separate entrances based on the color of your skin. And um, he Without, without saying any words or um, explaining to his grandkids before he did it or while, while they were doing it, he would lead them in through the door and the entrance into the section for people who were not of their race, um, for people who were um, uh, at that time color, uh, called colored. Um, and he would lead them in through the quote colored entrance um, and his uh, grandkids remember those signs uh, and walking in under that door. And while they were sitting in that restaurant, they would start to ask questions after a period of time and say, you know, why are, why are things different? Why, um, why are people asking us why we're on this side? Um, and, uh, and he would ask them, um, uh, so, you know, well, what do you think about that? And it really kind of led the grandkids in a very, um, at a very young age and clearly had a great impact on their questioning of um, injustices and why are we doing or not doing something about them and, and how can we potentially change them? And so um, in addition to that one specific um, example that uh, really kind of stuck with his grandkids, um, over time, uh, whether in business or in personal life, he was absolutely engaged with people of all races and ethnicities. And he led um, in that way, despite the criticisms from fellow business people, uh, people in the community, et cetera. Um, and this uh, quote here, um, I really love, um, was extracted from an article written about Mr. Shainberg that I'll show you guys here in a couple of slides, that quality of life is the greatest need for the human experience, that uh, really it's about how we are to each other and for each other, um, that um, is um, of utmost importance, um, uh, far beyond um, many of the other things we prioritize. So. 
Um, with regards to that, this is the um, a, an article written about Mr. Shaneberg um, in the University of Tennessee Health Sciences record. So this was the newspaper for UTHSC at the time. And again, if you look at the date, it's September 28th, 1979. And this was actually written um, after um, he had unfortunately experienced the loss of a, a spouse um, to cancer. And um, here was um, uh, donating um, significant funds um, uh, to um, the uh, children's, um, essentially what was going to become uh, the Labonner, um, uh, it's called the Clinical uh, Clinic for Exceptional Children, which is a program um, at the Children's Hospital. And it really was focused on uh, developmental pediatrics and focusing on that quality of life that he was describing and making sure that um, people of all ages it do experience that quality of life and we really try to maximize that. This is one of many examples of how Mr. Shaneberg really um, uh, uh, invested um, actively and led um, in this way as well um, in terms of what uh, he thought was most important in terms of um, our work together here. Um, and so with that in mind, um, you know, when the um, Shaneberg Lazaro family came to us um, with this idea um, of potentially um, looking at an exchange program uh, where medical students from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center go to Israel um, to experience clinical care. And similarly, uh, students from Ben Gurion University of the Negev, which is in Beersheba, um, those students are able to come to Memphis to do the same. The whole um, mission that we came together was really to uh, broaden access um, of, um, of learners of all, all types, but we were beginning with students. Um, uh, to experiences in clinical um, work and research work and professional development um, within a multicultural context. And uh, with that, you know, the intention is to really celebrate that legacy that Mr. Shanebrook has left um, and, and, and imprinted um, on his grandchildren, his great grandchildren and those uh, that are following. And this bi-directional exchange has been to focus on the experiences for our fourth year medical students. Um, primarily so that um, uh, our students have already completed the core rotations of, of third year. They're past the stress and the decision-making and interviews of match. And this is really um, primarily to help with professional development. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, Shaneberg Lazaro grandkids uh, said, you know, we're not interested in, in having you learn about hypertension, you know, the basics of hypertension. If you learn that or reinforce it while you're over there, that's great. But perhaps you think about hypertension and how it might be treated when you are in a nomadic community or when you don't have the resources to go to a clinic for regular blood pressure checks, or if you don't speak the same language as your physician um, that's treating you. Those are the things that they were interested in. And very similar to that, that same type of experience could certainly be experienced here in Memphis, that we absolutely have a multicultural um, uh, community here as well. Um, it might look different, it might sound different based on languages, we may have different backgrounds, but that's the whole point. And so the idea would be to really highlight these unique contexts, highlight our vulnerable communities, find parallelisms and things that are similar, but also understand the differences. And so when we look at rotation objectives, patient care, these are all very standard things that you all see in your um, rotations, core tenets of, of clinical care in the outpatient and inpatient setting, um, uh, assessing patient and family social determinants and how that might affect their presentation, treatment, and outcome, appreciating the differences um, uh, in practices um, in general, uh, both in healthcare um, here and then healthcare abroad. And then also the one thing that I would add is also culturally, what the culture of the healthcare system is like. Um, and then medical knowledge. There's certainly um, things that our scholars definitely saw and experienced uh, while uh, they were on rotation in Israel that they had not yet seen um, here in the States. And so that was an interesting and, and unique opportunity for them to uh, connect that pathophysiology with the physical manifestation of disease. Um, Practice-based improvement, um, aware um, definitely with this um, healthcare system in um, Israel, there's an opportunity for 
um, understanding um, policy, um, the importance of um, being active in policy, understanding how the health system affects outcomes, um, and then how um, the health system does or does not um, address specific um, needs uh, within varying communities um, of different cultures. Um, interprofessionally, uh, this was actually one unexpected um, but awesome um, uh, outcome uh, from this rotation was that our students were really able to experience a different medical culture, if you will. Um, what does it mean to be a physician uh, within this community versus a physician in the community at home, et cetera? Um, and then lastly, of course, um, you know, uh, communication and, re and relationships, especially around language. The professionalism and system-based practice is just, um, again, an extension of all the um, opportunities that arise when you are found out of a, a context, outside of a context that you're used to, and um, understanding how, um, what it's like to be in a situation where you don't speak the primary language, or whether when you need an interpreter or translator, um, or when even um, how physicians and patients communicate might look or sound different um, than the way it sounds back home. So these are just all some awesome, um, really um, wonderful opportunities to address all of these different things and, and touch upon them um, during this four week time period. Um, there are definitely some logistics and actually this is really the beginning of the experience when you start to think about the differences. So um, due to Shabbat, uh, Friday and Saturdays are off days um, in Israel. So Sunday is a work day. And when you all look at the dates for the rotation, we've really tried to actually demonstrate that typically our students actually arrive on Thursday and then they begin their work on that following Sunday. Um, there are very few academic requirements with regards to output. We really just want you to immerse yourself in the experience. There are two patient case reports, um, meaning out of all the patients you see during that four-week time period, we just want to want two. <laughs> just write two of them up. You can write more if you like, um, but tell us about two patients that you saw. Um, and there's an elective evaluation that you all already do for um, rotations here at UTHSC, and you just need to um, have that filled out easiest is to do it on paper, um, probably, um, uh, while you're there um, uh, to be um, evaluated by the Ben-Gurion faculty. Um, and then the biggest thing is the Shaneberg uh, Scholars uh, Grand Rounds um, uh, uh, at 12 noon on May 2nd. This is an annual um, CM, or I'm sorry, we have monthly CMGH Grand Rounds. And during this particular uh, session would be the session where we um, highlight our Shaneberg Scholars um, after they've returned from rotation. Um, speaking of rotations, the options are very similar to the way uh, to what we have here. So um, at the, um, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about Ben Gurion University. However, um, it is very much um, modeled um, after um, our, our uh, programs and, and structured um, really in alignment with our programs here in the US. And uh, many of the students there uh, might actually be from the US. However, um, you know, also students from all over the world attending school there, but the rotations are very similar. And there's absolutely, you know, all the core rotations that you would expect here in the United States, but some interesting ones like mass casualty, specific rotations with the Bedouin community, infectious disease in that area would be very interesting. Um, and we actually featured one of their uh, infectious disease experts um, uh, with our um, Grand Rounds here virtually um, when he talked about vaccination. Um, and then things like trauma. Um, and these can be done as a single four week rotation or two two week rotations. And this is modifiable all the way up until the time of your, um, uh, the month of your rotation, because things are constantly evolving as you all have seen here um, at our home institution, things are absolutely evolving uh, there as well. Some important travel information, um, what is covered? Um, so airfare, lodging, meals, that means your flight to and from Israel, Lodging, um, you mean where you're going to stay while you're there. Your meals on a daily basis are absolutely covered. Um, the one bummer is that things are still done in reimbursement mode, which as you know, takes longer. There's more paperwork and receipts and all that kind of stuff. But we are aiming and I'm in process of um, getting to a place where we can do direct expensing um, so that that will be kind of an immediate thing. You're not going to have any out of pocket. No promises there, but we're trying. Um, the housing, uh, what we've been told um, to ma make sure we highlight is that these are, you very much kind of think about them as dorms. So they are apartments, it's student housing, but you have to think about, okay, I may or may not have a roommate. 
and I will absolutely probably be using shared bathrooms. So being prepared for that kind of context. The nice thing again that our students said is, you know, hey, I didn't have to worry about going on Airbnb, figuring all that stuff out, but it is different than, um, than when, you know, kind of have to channel your college mode in early college years. Um, this obviously also would change um, if you are on a rotation in a Bedouin community, um, which these are um, mainly tent communities, you would not be in a dorm in this situation. Um, local transportation is provided. Um, they picked up our students from um, the airport, brought them to um, a beer shiva. Um, and then the only travel that's not covered is all the fun stuff. You know, there is a trail, um, you know, public transportation. You could also rent a vehicle. All these things were done by our students this past year. And there are, is a lot to see in the area within a few hours drive. And so um, definitely um, uh, one of those things where we would share those, um, that information from our students from last year. Speaking of our two students, um, Macy and Colby were our scholars for 2021. Um, they were very patient with us as we navigated the, the pandemic. Um, they were initially supposed to be going in March of 2020. And of course that was delayed. Um, and on a monthly basis, we had, are we going, are we not going? That question asked every single month from March, 2020 until um, a March of this year. And so they were able to give us a fair amount of feedback. Um, Interestingly, one thing that is different um, at uh, Ben Gurion University, uh, which is also called the Medical School for International Health, is that um, there are certain rotations and certain times of the year where all of the M4s do rotations as a group, meaning the entire class is going through the same rotation at the same time. That's something that's very unique. And they actually loved it. Um, there uh, were there's a, such an incredible opportunity for them to interact with students from all over the world. Um, a student from Korea, a student from um, uh, China, a student uh, from the Middle East, um, a student from the United States. And so these um, things are um, not predictable. You know, it all just uh, depends on the, what's happening at the time. Um, and, and for that reason, unfortunately, their two week immersion with the Bedouin community was canceled and that was due to a shooting um, uh, that happened last minute. Uh, we were definitely very disappointed. However, um, policy, as you know, not just for UTHSD, but even for our friends in Israel is that any there, anytime there's an active conflict, uh, we pull our students out of that context uh, for safety. The other awesome, you know, kind of uh, side uh, benefit of this, um, I put travel in there because the <laughs> our scholars saw more of Israel in the short time that they were there um, than our even uh, the family that is sponsoring this um, was able to see in in you know in in their time, and so um, their the breadth and the um, uh, depth of experience is absolutely just depending on what you would like. You don't have to travel outside. Of Beersheba and Tel Aviv area, you absolutely could stay there. However, um, you know, seeing all different seasons uh, within the same day, um, the ocean, the Dead Sea, you know, <clears throat> water, mountains, desert, all of those sorts of things are just all within driving distance. And it's been um, really fun to kind of uh, uh, live vicariously through our scholars travels. And we hope that, you know, if you are interested in that, that you would be able to continue in that and, and continue to experience that variety within such a small area. This last one here, the different and refreshing difference in hospital or doctor culture was one that again, we did not really kind of predict. Uh, it's not something we really talked about. Um, one of our uh, rabbi uh, friends here locally did kind of prepare a little bit for that, but it was one thing that really our scholars picked up on that was very different um, than the um, culture here in that, um, you know, we're very fairly individualistic here um, with regards to our practices, et cetera, whereas uh, what she experienced on rotation was very much a, a team um, effort. There was very little in terms of hierarchical differences in how people talk to each other, how work was divided, et cetera. And so it was definitely kind of more um, egalitarian as opposed to hierarchical. Um, and that was an interesting and refreshing uh, difference for them and, and really kind of had them questioning how, how do I want to you know, uh, manage my practice, et cetera. Any questions so far? Okay. So what are the current COVID-19 travel restrictions? I have to put this in here because 
Um, and look going on to the, um, uh, the website, um, uh, the travel.gov website fairly regularly, just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, per the advisory committee on epidemic control in Israel, this is um, the local um, uh, countrywide um, uh, decision maker around vaccinations, around masks, et cetera. It's their CDC. Um, there currently um, is a, man is a, um, a mandate uh, for vaccination for all healthcare workers, which all of our students would you know, fall in, within that um, and, and just have to provide uh, documentation of your vaccinations. Um, indoor masking is um, recommended for indoor gatherings um, uh, and outdoors, not so much. Um, again, it's up to you individually based on what you would prefer to do based on your own risk, et cetera. But for indoors and especially for gatherings of people, which um, the work uh, uh, setting would absolutely um, uh, require that. And then hospital and clinic dependent. So each um, you would have to definitely check in with each of your rotations as far as what the requirements are there. Very similar to how you know UTHSC as a building um, at 910 versus going into regional one clinics, et cetera. Again, this is all subject to change. Um, so that'll be updated on, a, we'll be updating that on a monthly basis. basis. This is just a, um, a screenshot from the travel advisory uh, website, which um, all of y'all are welcome to do, uh, to go to, but this uh, travel advisory has been in place for really years um, in terms of travel to the West Bank and Gaza. X, um, level two is exercise increased caution. When we canceled or held off on uh, launching the Shaneberg Scholars Exchange Program over the past, uh, back in 2020 and 2021, at that point we were in between uh, level three and level four, depend, uh, verse, um, depending on whether we were talking about COVID or unrest. And so within that, um, with regards to um, the reconsidered travel, if we should ever get back into that um, uh, range, we would, we would have to look at why. Um, is it due to unrest um, in the West Bank and Gaza? Because we will not be going there. Um, uh, or um, is it due to COVID-19, in which case it might require um, uh, a testing and whatnot? Because currently there is no required um, <coughs> um, 72 hour uh, testing uh, for flights to Israel at this moment in time. Again, that could be, cha could be changing. So that's a monthly um, uh, minimum as far as updates there. Is a visa needed? Um, last year, we absolutely needed visas, or this year, we absolutely needed visas uh, when our scholars went in March. Um, currently, the answer is no for tourists. This, um, the visa mandate was lifted in May, um, and no for stays for less than 90 days. And so hopefully this will not change. Um, again, it is subject to change, and we'll have to keep on an ongoing um, uh, um, eval of this. But if um, visas are required, we'll absolutely walk you through that process. Macy and Colby had to fly to DC to apply for a visa in person because that's the only way they could do it um, <laughs> in the middle of the pandemic. And it was, um, it was incredible uh, amount of effort, um, but it was worth it uh, for them to be able to do that. So hopefully we'll be able to um, apply for visas uh, via the internet again, if this um, mandate should be put back in place. And of course, if we do have to travel, all that would be provided. So the application process is pretty straightforward. It's also pretty quick. So the application will open on September 5th. Um, it's not long and laborious. Um, it's just really some basic demographic stuff and five questions. Um, there's no long essays. You, you're allowed to write an essay if you want to, you don't have to, um, but nothing more than 500 words uh, within one of the questions. Um, uh, most of the other questions are very short answer. Um, so it'll open on September 5th, 2022 at 8 a.m. And then it will close just a little over a month later on November 18th at 5 p.m. Uh, we have a selection committee um, that was, I'll tell you a little bit about um, here in a moment that will meet that very next week um, into December um, to review um, uh, the applicants. Um, Last, this past cohort with Macy and Colby, it took us six meetings, um, each meeting almost uh, two hours to go through everyone's application because um, it was incredibly close. Um, we had a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion um, about each and every student. So for every applicant, they're absolutely given a thorough review um, and discussion um, on the table for consideration. 
Um, and so after uh, the committee finishes out on the um, afternoon of the 16th, all scholars will then be announced at 8 a.m. on December 19th. This is so that, you know, we understand, you know, fourth year is a crazy time. Rotations are always shifting. And we want to allow as much time uh, in advance for you to move things if need be. But again, this is post match. Um, so that'll be a little bit more freedom um, just to allow for, um, for any modifications in your schedule. This is a screenshot of the um, uh, application itself. It's, it's UT <laughs> orange and green. Um, and as I said earlier, there are five questions. Um, if I scroll down there, um, it really starts off with just who you are, um, contact information, et cetera, and then goes on into um, uh, questions that were fashioned by the family um, and the um, development committee. Mainly just asking about why, what your interest is in the program, uh, what you hope to get out of it, and uh, one you know kind of life experience or or professional experience that you think is relevant that might help feed in that that might be feeding you into um, uh, wanting to uh, apply to this program. So who decides? Well, um, there's definitely academic standing verification by Dean Witt. We don't want to send um, students who are um, not doing well and, and need academic support. Um, again, this is post batch so there's a little bit less important, but um, for anybody who needs to be um, on home base, um, we want to keep them by home base. So that's the intention there with that verification by Dean Witt. And then the scholar selection committee is made of a mixture of all sorts of folks. Um, not everybody is faculty and definitely not everyone is medicine. So we have non-medical people um, uh, that are uh, faculty. So. Um, non-college of medicine um, or non-physician faculty within the College of Medicine. We have family appointed members from the Jewish community, from um, other parts of the community here in Memphis that are, are very much connected um, to um, the Shaneberg uh, story. Uh, we have folks who are from the Board of Visitors who are involved and all of them are very involved, which has been really amazing to, to work with them and, and um, just know that you're in very, very good hands when you apply. Um, I do not have any control over this. I don't vote, um, nor do any of our um, uh, development team, which is Dr. Glazer, Dean Witt, and um, uh, Matthew Davis. So um, all the voting happens within that selection committee. Um, with regards to um, uh, questions, I'm always available. And I really kind of wanted to close out with talking a little bit about Ben Gurion University. And I probably should have put this at the very beginning, but this is a link to um, our website um, that has uh, a description of our, our, our um, partnership with them. Ben Gurion University of the Negev is um, also is, is a medical school for international health. It was founded um, really um, as a, an institution from the ground up and from year one, uh, from your first day there, to really incorporate multicultural health experiences into your ed medical school education. And what that means is um, there are monthly and weekly lectures and talks on all aspects of um, working um, with um, or in the context of um, people from various cultures with various beliefs, with various practices and various needs. And so um, with that in mind, when our students go, that programming is already there. What's interesting is it's almost like when you go on a cruise, you're just given a calendar and said, okay, here are all the lectures that are happening this month. You're welcome to attend any or all of them, which is really incredible. They can attend classes um, and lectures in that context, but then there are also these extracurricular activities that happen with the medical students as well, outside of that kind of didactic um, experience. The other interesting thing about Ben Gurion is that they have many, many international partners outside of Israel, um, including in Sri Lanka and in India um, and various parts of um, Europe and the Middle East <coughs> and Southeast Asia. Um, where their students can rotate. And um, currently, um, really to help um, the UT HSC students and for this experience to really kind of become grounded, we're starting off with this rotation in Beersheba at their home institution. With time, we will open up um, this uh, partnership to allow for our students to also, through Ben Gurion University, rotate at these international partner sites. 
that's to come that would not be for 2023 but just so that you all know where we're headed in terms of this partnership that's one additional piece the other piece about our partnership is that the partnership between uh, UTHSE and Ben Gurion University is not just this exchange program. There are several things happening in the research area. There are several things happening just in terms of didactics and grand rounds. The, we actually just had uh, Dr. Terrigan, who is the primary uh, site director for um, Ben Gurion University for our students. Um, he just came here to do um, a visiting lecture and, and was a visiting professor for us. And those are just kind of really the beginning of, of how we're working together. We're still learning um, how we can work together more, but just so you know that this is absolutely a long-term relationship that's an evolution. And with that, I'll stop and just ask for any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zalmea, for your presentation. And um, the, the uh, Shane Berg Scholars Program uh, seems like a very interesting opportunity. I was looking at the uh, Ben Gurion University, like the, the profile and their uh, website, and they have the um, uh, uh, Beersheba, Bersh which, which is where Ben Gurion is, is also like a major center for uh, tech, Israel's technology industry, and they have the National Institute of Biotechnology. Um, not that I would be looking to do a whole rotation, but perhaps if there would be opportunities to just see how they partner between the clinical side and the um, translational research side, would there be opportunities for that potentially? Absolutely. Um, this is the blessing of having small cohorts um, and being very much connected. So, um, let's say you are selected as a scholar, what will happen over the next um, you know, two or three months in preparation for your rotation is we'll go back and forth with Dr. Terrigan and you actually fashion your own rotation really. You know, There are things you can say, hey, yes, I would love to do derm or yes, I'd love to do internal medicine. But if there, there, there are infinite number of possibilities with regards to research um, uh, sorts of um, opportunities. As I mentioned earlier, one thing that was really interesting um, uh, that preceded our scholars going there was um, just around vaccine research um, and the speed with which they were able to develop their vaccinations and deploy them. And that was actually one idea for a whole nother rotation was really looking at public health and manufacturing and, and the connection between clinical um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, biotechnology. Uh, and it, it happens so quickly um, because of the way the system works there, that would be absolutely an interesting thing. I think that's a great idea and would be possible. Thank you so much. Great question. Yeah, and what I'll do is um, we'll share these slides um, and the recording, of course, um, uh, for folks who were not able to make it. This is my email here. Um, if I don't answer, you know, in the net first couple couple of days, don't give up. Um, I also have my cell phone at the bottom of my email uh, signature. You can always text me. But happy to do this again, uh, closer to the time period of the um, application being deployed. But once the application is open, you'll absolutely see it blasted over emails to your listserv, et cetera. Um, but thanks so much for joining and y'all have a great day.